Well, good morning, church. Good to see you guys. Everyone looks wide awake, bright-eyed, happy to be here, stoked that the student director is the one speaking to you today. You didn't have to laugh at that. You could have just been like, yeah, we're happy to be here. No, I'm excited, guys. Looking forward to this. I'm grateful for any chance, Pastor Brian, Pastor Robert, give me uh, to be part of the teaching team. Um, as you can see today, we have an amazing prop right here for you to focus your attention on. Um, very, very helpful. So just embrace the, the TV that's not on. But it's all good. So today, guys, we are continuing our series called Pursue. And so for the past almost a month now, I think today makes a month, we've been looking at this verse out of 1 Timothy chapter 6, where Paul is writing to his protege, Timothy. And we've been examining these different characteristics that Paul is encouraging Timothy to pursue. With this kind of main mindset, what we've talked about all month long is this idea that the goal of Christianity is not about changing behaviors. It's not behavior modification. It's about becoming a new person. You see, everything we see in Scripture, everything we know about God and we learn about Him, He does want us to do certain things, yes. But He is far more concerned with the person that we are becoming in the process. Hosea 6.6 6 says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Sacrifice and burnt offerings were both things that God commanded of his followers, yet God is saying, what's more important to me, though, is the character of your heart as an individual following after me. And Jesus himself had gone to quote that to the Pharisees. And so today, we dive back into this verse, and um, there's a lot to this. I know I talk fast. A number of you guys have told me that. I apologize. You can take it up with the Lord. He made me who I am. Um, <clears throat> but... <laughs> Because there's so much, I'm, I'm, we're going to dive right on into this because I'm very excited. Um, I'll be honest, as I was preparing for this message, I, I, I became very, very excited for it because it's something that's been on my heart for a while, and I haven't known how to put it to words. Like As I've thought through it and studied both in school and just doing student ministry, um, there have been things that have swirled in my heart and in my mind that I haven't had the words to. I haven't known how to express them. And studying this passage, suddenly it all kind of fell into place. I was like, yes, that is what I have been feeling. And it was super convicting. This is not a message I'm preaching at anyone. This was a message that over the weeks um, uh, of preparation, I've, I've had preached to myself um, because I think it, I know it's something I struggle with. And in my experience, I think it's something that many of us do wrestle with. And so diving into the verse that we've been studying, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, if you have your Bibles with you, I believe it's on screen now. Golly, can we get up for Josh? What a man right there. Woo! 1 Timothy chapter 6 says this, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, these things being kind of the negative habits he talked about in the preceding chapter, and instead pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Beautiful characteristics, and the one that we are focusing on this week is steadfastness. Pursue steadfastness. Now, steadfastness is a great word. It doesn't typically need a whole lot of explanation. Most of us kind of get, like, oh, steadfast, I need to endure, okay, I need to be constant. But as I was researching this, I realized that there's, there's something that accompanies steadfast or steadfastness. That without this piece, steadfastness does not exist. It doesn't matter how constant you are. If this is not there, you are not steadfast. And so we see what steadfastness actually means is this. It's the capacity to continue under difficult circumstances. And what we see is this, that there is an inherent link between difficulty and steadfastness. You see, Paul is not telling Timothy, Timothy, I want you just to remain constant. Being constant and being steadfast are two completely different things. You can be constant in a simple, easy manner. That doesn't mean that you're steadfast. What Paul is telling Timothy is, Timothy, there will be difficulty and you must endure and continue in the midst of that difficulty. When I lived up in Georgia, uh, we used to go out to this collection of waterfalls about 20 minutes from the property we lived on, and it was about a 45-minute hike. We drive there 20 minutes, 45-minute hike, and you go out, and it's absolutely gorgeous. You've ever been up to like North Georgia, up near the Tennessee Georgia line? Beautiful, God's country. And, and we would get there, and there's this series of waterfalls that would kind of cr uh, crash down over these steps built in the mountain, and they would kind of open up into this wide stream. It was a good like 20 feet wide, just kind of flowing down, nice and peaceful. And a lot of times we'd stand in the stream and have uh, a devotional time together. And if you were to stand in the stream and look, you would see twigs and leaves and little things just kind of gently floating by, carried by the, the course of the water. Now, never in all the times we did that did I ever look at what was gently floating in the water and say, man, that thing's going to endure right there. That's steadfast. That's strong. But if you turned behind you and looked up at the water fountain, there were these really neat rocks that would actually stick out about two feet and the water would crash over it and the rock would just stay there as gallons and gallons of water just crashing over this rock. And that's what I would look at and say, you know, that is steadfast. 
the thing that's gently flowing, or even the pebbles that didn't flow but were, were, were constant in the stream bed, they're not steadfast. There's no difficulty. There's no challenge there. The boulders sticking out of the rock wall that had the water crashing around it, those are the things that we look at and we say, yes, that is steadfast, that endures, that will be there. And the same thing Timothy is saying, uh, Paul is saying is true of us in our lives is, one, there will be difficulty. And to be steadfast, Timothy, and future believers means that in the midst of difficulty, not easiness, in the midst of difficulty, we must continue and pursue. And so to further unpack this idea of pursuing, pursuing steadfastness, and this whole month you might have picked up, um, go back to that slide right before this for me, uh, Jeffrey. The, the other word that we're really keying in this whole month is that word pursue. None of these qualities are just passive qualities. Paul is not saying just kind of passively become righteous, just kind of passively have faith, passively love your neighbors and the difficult people, passively become steadfast. No, he's saying pursue these things implying that there's an effort being made on the behalf of the believer to become more like each of these qualities. We don't just become steadfast. You don't just become gentle. You're not just suddenly, righteousness might be the only exception because righteousness comes from Christ. But what Paul is saying is all of these can be heartily pursued and embodied more as we go on. And so steadfastness, this endurance in the midst of difficulty is something that we as believers, and I think this is awesome, is that all of us have the same potential to pursue it. I don't believe that anyone is born with a better capacity to be steadfast than someone else. I think some people choose it more, and some of us, and I'm one of these, step away from it more because it is difficult. But I think everyone has the same capacity. And so to unpack this a little more, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is kind of where we're going to sit today. So if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. And Paul's writing this letter to the church in Corinth. A little background history on that. The church of Corinth was not a good place. The church of Corinth was known as being a hotbed of religion. There was a temple there to almost every god or goddess that you could imagine, okay? All sorts of priests, all sorts of beliefs, and the letter that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians is not like, hey, you guys are doing awesome. Congratulations. I'm so proud of y'all. I'm so glad I get to know you. No, it was like a mom coming home and finding that that list was not done that she left for her six-year-old kid, right? Paul is ticked beyond belief, and he calls them out the whole letter. How have you guys become like this? I knew you. I met you. I've written to you before. What is going on. And he calls out all these issues that are happening in Corinth. But the cool thing about Paul is Paul never just rips a believer apart and then lets it hang. Like Paul's goal is always, I want you to know how you can be a better believer, a better follower, represent Christ better. So Paul goes through most of his letter just kind of calling out their sin, which is a good thing. And then he concludes in the last couple chapters encouraging them. And he says this in chapter 15, verse 48, we see this. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now, this truly is a beautiful verse, and we don't have the time to fully unpack all that Paul is dealing with in this letter to the church at Corinth, but what he is encouraging the believers to right here is amazing, and it's very hopeful. But to understand what he's saying, we got to break this down a little more. And so, uh, what's interesting is this word steadfast is not the same word we saw in that verse a minute ago, pursue steadfastness. They, they, they have a similar direction, but they both mean different things. And, and the thing with translation, anytime we translate, like when the Bible's translated, uh, Greek and English are not one-to-one -one languages. You say a word in Greek, it doesn't necessarily mean a, an identical word in English. Sometimes you say a word in Greek and it has a, a phrase or, a, or, a, or an understanding that would better encapsulate what's trying to be said. And so in our verse just a minute ago, we saw that pursue steadfastness. That word steadfastness in the Greek is the word hupamanein. And hupamanein literally means steadfast or patient endurance. It's to be solid, be still, be where you are, endure past the difficulty. The word that Paul uses here is a different word. It's the Greek word hedreoi. And hedreoi does not mean patient endurance. Hedreoi means or it would convey the idea that you need to be secure in your positioning, your opinions. And what Paul is saying to believers is this, okay, my beloved brothers, you must be secure in why you believe, what you believe, who you believe. Before anything else, before you face any kind of difficulty, before anything else happens, you need to be firmly established in who you are and what you believe. That's the first step in being steadfast. And he moves on. This word immovable, it, it kind of has a negative con uh, contrast to that. It means the same thing, but on the negative. So he's saying, be firmly established and not easily shaken. That's really what Paul is saying here. Be firmly established in your position as a believer of Christ. 
and your opinions and who you follow, don't be easily shaken. Because all up to this, he's been talking about things that have shaken the church at Corinth that have pulled them away. Controversies, false teachings, um, ideals that they want to pursue because life would be nicer and easier and better if we could pursue life like that, but that the scriptures tell us is not good for us. And so Paul tells us, be firm in who you are, what you believe. Don't be easily shaking. The word abounding right here, it conveys the sense of going far above and beyond what's expected. And so he's saying, believers, you must go above and beyond what's expected of you in the work of the Lord. Now, that could become very legalistic. We could easily look at that and be like, well, that means that I just have to come to church eight times a week, I guess. Uh, That's what the pastor said. I should probably start tithing at least, you know, 80% of my income. Like, man, have you seen that church? They need help. Let's give it to them. Oh, he saw it now. Reading the scriptures we got to step that up. Family, we're going to read through this Bible 18 times a year. So go pull out your adventure Bible. Come on, bring it over here. We're going to break this down. And that's not what Paul is saying here. Because what we see about Christianity and what we see about being a Christian is that in no way, and this is conveyed all throughout Scripture, in no way is Christianity finishing a checklist. It's about following Christ. You see, all through Scripture, even when when Jesus has his disciples, he's not giving them these tasks to say, go do these tasks, go minister, go call out spirits in my name, go heal, go proclaim the gospel message and check it off because you've done it and now you're right in my sight. No, Christ tells us, you're right in my Father's sight because of what I've done now. Seek me, follow me, be more like me. Does that mean you need to read your Bible in 30 days? No. (laughs) Hopefully as we're growing though, we are spending more time with Christ. I think the issue with this, really, what what Paul is getting at here is he's telling believers in 1 Corinthians 15, abound in the work of of the Lord. He's saying, don't be mediocre. Don't do what is acceptable as a Christian. What is acceptable? Okay, I go to church once a week. Check. You know, I read a devotional for five minutes. Check. I sometimes pray for the people in my life that are difficult. Sometimes not. It's okay. That's why there's grace. But I try. Check. Check. And Paul is is telling us about this because a life of mediocrity is a sad place to be at. And I think that in the church following Christ, there is no room for mediocrity. For me personally, my greatest fear, and I'll talk about this a little more at the end, like I'm a person up until I met Christ that was characterized by fear. That was the defining um, personality trait of foster pre-Christ, fear, fear of everything. My greatest fear now, I still have fears, it's not the same, but my greatest fear now is that I would somehow become insignificant in this life. That when I stand before God and he he opens the book of my life and he's reading through it, he gets the last page and he's like, Foster, I'll be honest with you, in the grand scope of my story, nothing would have really been different if you hadn't been there. Like that terrifies me to my core. And this is what Paul is getting at with that abounding. He's telling us, don't be mediocre in your faith. Don't do just what is acceptable. Strive to be more like Christ. You will fail. And that's encouraging to know because I do fail. And so Paul's like, you're not going to fail if you do it right. Man, I'm a horrible failure then. (laughs) But he's saying you will fail, but strive every single day to do more than you believe is asked, to become more like Christ. Don't worry about getting everything right. It's not a checklist. You're following Christ. Today, take a step, be more like him. Pursue that steadfastness no matter how difficult it can be. Jeffrey, I know I'm mixing things up on you. You can go back to that 1 Corinthians verse real quick because as we look at this verse, there's two last things that we have to examine. The first is this word labor. And this is kind of really where we're getting to the heart of this message. Paul is saying, knowing, you know, always bound the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And it's easy for us to look at that word and assume that Paul is saying, oh, just your task or your work. But the word there actually means difficult task. Paul is saying up front, the things that you're doing for Christ will be difficult. They're not easy. And what we said at the beginning, steadfastness involves difficulty. Without difficulty, you can't be steadfast. And Paul is hammering that home here. Be steadfast in your difficult work. Now, as we look at this verse, and we're going to come back to the difficulty because the difficulty is important. And for me personally, being aware of difficulty helps me face it. If I know that something is going to be difficult when I step into it, I'm much more apt to follow through. Anyone else like that? Whereas if like you get into it and all of a sudden you're just surprised by how difficult it is, I put up a wall. I pull back. I do something distance. If there's difficulty, it means something's not right, okay? If I go to hit the gas on my car and there's like sound, like there's difficulty in the engine, that means take your foot off the gas, 
Um, if you're a teen in here, that was a nice little tip for you. If you find yourself going down the highway and your engine is just like screeching, take your foot off the gas, okay? And so a lot of times we apply that to our lives. When it becomes difficult, take my foot off the gas and wait. Let's see what's wrong. Let's see what is happening right here. But the reality is in life sometimes things do happen that are difficult. And if I know ahead of time that it is going to be difficult, as Paul says it is, I am far more likely to be steadfast, to face it, and to endure. And so the last thing I want to ask, because being steadfast is a, is a great trait, but difficulty is not enjoyable. And so the question should come to our mind, why should I be steadfast then, Foster? If Christ died for me, my salvation is assured, why be steadfast in the midst of difficulty? Why not just avoid it and wait for Christ to come back and I can be done with this? Because difficulty is not fun. And we have to ask this question. And we've said it before in church. I had a professor who used to ask it all the time. This verse right here, number one question, what is the therefore, therefore? Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. What is the therefore, therefore? What was Paul talking about? You see, in the chapters leading up to this one in 1 Corinthians, the last two chapters leading up to it, Paul is talking about one specific issue. It's the issue of the resurrection. You see, in the church at Corinth, there was this heresy going around that the resurrection was not a thing. Christ had not been resurrected. And if Christ hadn't been resurrected, then none of us would be resurrected. And if none of us were going to be resurrected, then our faith is pointless. And Paul actually says that word for word. If Christ is not resurrected, your faith is futile. In fact, if Christ has not been resurrected, if none of this is really true, then we Christians are the most to be pitied in the world because we are fools. That's Paul's words, not mine. It makes sense. Paul is saying, because he breaks that down and he lays out an argument that the resurrection is true, that all of it is true. There is a God. Humanity sinned. God sent his son because we deserve hell, separation from God. His son died for us, brought salvation, and one day we will stand in eternity. Therefore, since eternity is real, be steadfast. Since there is something after this life, since there is a greater picture, a higher story, something far above and beyond anything good or bad, and sometimes it literally is bad that we face today, since eternity is real, this is not it. Be steadfast. You see, as we've been going over these qualities, they're great qualities. I don't know anyone that would look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and be like, you know what? Nah, I don't really want to be righteous. That doesn't sound like my cup of tea. Faith? Ah. It's not as cracked up to be love. Oh, gross. Like, they, no, no love for the people that are different from us. All of these qualities are great, but here's the thing. We aren't pursuing these qualities as Christians so that we can end up better now. That's not the point. You see, we're pursuing these qualities because now is not the end. That's the reason that we're doing all of this. And that's what Paul is getting at here. You're not pursuing these qualities, Church of Corinth or Timothy, because you want to be a better person now. Hopefully you'll become a better person. Amen. But you're really pursuing these because now what you are, who you are, where you're at is not the end. There is so much more. As we read through scripture, we, we do kind of get the idea that the way that we live our lives now impacts our eternity. How that works, I don't know. I've yet to find a scholar, a book, anyone who can explain that. I don't think scripture fully explains that. But it is very clear in scripture that the way that we live now does somehow have an impact on eternity. Now, I don't think that means that if you do all the right things and, and you do the checklist and you get it right, that somehow you're, more, you're better in God's eyes. I don't think that's how that works. But I do see in Scripture very clearly that the way I live now, the way I pursue Christ, or the way that I don't pursue Christ, even though my soul is saved, will have an impact on that story in eternity. And I think that's why Paul is encouraging Timothy and the church here, you need to be focused on being steadfast in difficulty because this is not the end. There is something more that is coming. In our culture, difficulty is not something that we typically sprint to. For the most part, I do believe that our society, I love our society. I love what I do. I love getting to be a part of teenagers' lives and point them to Christ. God has blessed me immensely, letting me live here. I love our country. I love my, my staff, my leadership here. But I do believe that our culture and our society is very difficulty averse. We take great strides to eliminate difficulty. And sometimes that's okay. I would much rather walk, drive to work than walk to work. I'm going to be honest with you, okay? The difficulty of walking across Hancock is not something I want to face. But in other ways, I find myself far more apt to go out of my way to avoid difficulty than to face it. 
And when we look at our faith, I think this question comes to mind, at least for me, maybe it does for you, and is does our faith have to encounter difficulty? Does difficulty have to be a part of the story? Isn't there a way that I can pursue God, pursue Christ, and do the things he's called me to, and things go well? Doesn't it say that God blesses the faithful? God blesses those who pursue him? So I want to look at something Jesus said that helps us understand this. John chapter 15, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. It's the Last Supper. It's coming to a close. The disciples aren't fully grasping, but Jesus knows what's coming. And he's having this last discourse with his closest friends. And he starts telling them all these I am statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he gets to his very last I am statement, John 15. He says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And what this verse clearly shows us is that the only way that our lives have significance, that we're able to bear fruit, is when we are fully aligned and abiding with Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read scriptures, Christ's life was not pretty. Christ faced a lot of difficulty, far more than we actually see in scripture. Christ faced difficulty inside, outside, upside, downside. Everywhere he went, there was difficulty. In his last moment, his greatest friends abandoned him. Right before he surrendered his spirit, his father, God Almighty, turned his face away. Christ's life was one of difficulty, and yet Christ is saying, if your life is to have significance, it must be abiding in me, 100%. Blessings are true, absolutely. And we see this, a couple of verses before, Jesus says this, I'm the vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he blesses that it may bear more fruit, amen? Except that's not what that verse says. Flip it for me real quick, Jeffrey. I'm the vine, my father's vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, does the right thing, he prunes. That it may bear more fruit. I think sometimes we've almost subconsciously believed the first verse. God does bless, amen. But I think we think that, oh, if I do the right thing, if I pursue Christ like I'm supposed to, he blesses me that I may bear more fruit. I think he does bless. I think sometimes blessing looks like a shearer coming at us to prune us. There are so many things in life that show us that the easy way is not always best. I don't know about you guys. I remember being in kindergarten and doing the butterfly project. And you guys, you have little kids that do the butterfly project. They build the box. They bring the caterpillars in in the classroom. They watch them turn into chrysalis, and then they they hatch, right? And so I remember doing this, Claremont Elementary School, Miss Larkin's kindergarten class. We had the box for about a month and a half, however long it took. And and the the, the chrysalis start to hatch, and these butterflies come out. And inevitably, if you had a kid that's done this, if you're a teacher and you've had kids, there's always at least one, if not the entire class, that's watching them hatch. And it's a, it's a slow process, and someone's like, well, let's help them, right? Let's crack the chrysalis open. Let's make it easy on them. And, and teachers always look at the kids like, no, 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 no. Because if you crack that chrysalis and help that butterfly out, you make it easy on them. You're blessing them, okay? What happens to the butterfly? It dies. Because that struggle and that difficulty of breaking through the chrysalis shell is actually what gives it the strength to continue in life. And this is seen all throughout the world. There's all sorts of uh, reptiles and birds that if you help them get through the shell, they die shortly after because their body hasn't built up the strength from pressing through that ordeal to survive. I think sometimes the same happens to us. We, we, We want God's blessing to come and break the shell for me because this is difficult and it's painful and it's tough. But I think God's blessing is, no, 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 no. I'm gonna let you break that because if I break it for you, it will be worse for you in the long run. Sometimes I think that blessing is difficulty. I think it is a trial because God didn't call us to mediocrity. I'm convinced, and I'm not an expert on anything, um, but in all my years of working with teens and studying what's going on, we are facing another epidemic right now. It's not an epidemic that's viral. Um, It's an epidemic of anxiety. Our culture is overwhelmed to its knees with anxiety and fear and depression. And please hear me on this before I continue. I am not saying that there are not legitimate reasons for that. Sometimes our body does not work the way it's supposed to work, and chemicals can get out of whack, and yes, we become un, unrealistically anxious, like it's a real thing, or we become depressed, and medicine is a great thing, counselors are a great thing, but I also believe that for some of us in that category, that anxiety and fear come from being so difficulty averse. We've deprived ourselves of the chrysalis breakthrough that is going to strengthen us and help us to get through the more difficult moments. And so when we face those, our reaction is overwhelming fear and despair, and we run from the difficulty, we hide from it, we throw up every barrier we can. I'm not telling you that you should seek out difficulty. Paul doesn't tell us that. I'm not saying that some of the difficulties that we face are not truly terrible. 
worth mourning over. Some situations are horrible, but I am saying that we as believers should not structure our lives around avoiding difficulty. Evangelizing is difficult. Seeking reconciliation with someone that the relationship's been damaged, that is difficult. Displaying Christ to people who do not display it to you is difficult. Living out your Christian convictions is difficult. Fitting in a quiet time into your already overpacked week is difficult. Pursuing Christ when God is quiet is difficult. But I do believe that if we're to be steadfast and to pursue steadfastness, we must be willing to pursue that difficulty as well. And so as you conclude today, this is kind of what I want you to take away with regards to steadfastness. We pursue steadfastness by leaning into difficulty, not by looking away. Far too often we see the signs that it's about to be rough and it's about to be difficult and we throw up every shield. We run the opposite way to get away from it because it is uncomfortable. Paul never says it's going to be comfortable. But he does say if you are to be more like Christ, if you are truly going to pursue steadfastness, you must be firm in your position and in your opinions, not easily shaking, continuing in your difficult task. Looking away can easily become running away. I'm not... Like I said, this is not a message for y'all. This is a message for Foster. Y'all just get to be a sideline audience to it. My whole life before I met Jesus was defined by fear. Everything about it. My mom used to call me her little old man. That's no offense to anyone here who is a gentleman and is a little advanced in age, okay? I think, I, I don't look at older men, my grandfather, and think, wow, they're weak and scared. But she used to call me that because I would just worry about everything. I would worry that my parents weren't coming home. We would drive in the car and it would storm, which in Florida does it like every 38 seconds. And I would literally like pull my shirt over my head because I was terrified we were going to get hydroplane in the road. As a six-year-old, who thinks about hydroplaning at six years old? And we were going to die. I was afraid that my family wasn't coming home. I was afraid of getting sick. I was afraid of every little thing. And I ran from it because it terrified me. Up until about the age of 14, everything was about avoiding fear because fear was constant and paramount. And at 14, I met Jesus. And I don't have a testimony that says, you know, I used to be a murderer, and then I went to the third grade and, and you know, met Jesus. And that's not, that's not my testimony. I'm sorry I don't have that cool testimony, okay? My testimony is I was a terrified coward. And then I met Jesus and realized there's a God who's over everything. And he looked at me and said, Foster, why are you afraid of what I control? I'm not promising you nothing bad is going to happen, Foster, but I am promising you I am in complete control. There's nothing outside my control. And I made you with a purpose. You're not an accident floating like a leaf down this little brook. No, I've made you to be a rock in the wall that as the water comes crashing past it, you would endure because I have a plan and a purpose for you. When I graduated high school, that fear came back a little bit as I was faced with the difficulty of life. Didn't know what I wanted to do, and so I ran from it because it was far easier to run and hide from the difficulty. I got a job. I worked 50 hours a week. I told myself, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm working hard, but really, I was running from the difficulty. After a few years, God opened the door for me to step out into what scared me, to leave home. I did. I moved to Georgia. God did amazing things there. I came home. I started pursuing nursing. Nursing wasn't the plan. It wasn't what I wanted to do, but God had said, Foster, if you'll trust me in this, I will bring you where you need to be. I'm not a nurse, okay? I do believe that God used my pre-nursing education to help me wait for what would happen here at the Church of South Lake. A door would open that I get to be a part of this. All along the way, there was fear. One of my commitments in life over the past four or five years has been that I will not live in fear as much as I can. That when I'm afraid of something, I step into it. And I'm not always successful. But I do think that if we pursue steadfastness, we acknowledge that difficulty is part of the story. It doesn't mean something's wrong. If we lean into that difficulty, I think we see God grow us and mature us and give us opportunities to become the person that he created us to be, the men and women following after him. Because again, this is the whole purpose of this entire series. The goal of Christianity is not about behavior modification. It's not changing your behavior. I'm not wanting you to pursue just so that you can say you're more faithful. The purpose is that you become a new person. That you become a person that is defined and characterized by leaning into the difficulty around them. A person that is characterized by facing fear. A person that is characterized by doing what it takes to show Christ to someone even when it's uncomfortable and when it's difficult. I think that is what Paul is telling us here. Be steadfast. Continue in the face of difficult circumstances. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't hide from the difficulty. Don't run from the difficulty. 
face it down. For I, the Lord your God, am with you. And that's always been the story. When hope seemed lost, nothing could continue. God sent his son Jesus to die for you and for me because we were afraid, because we couldn't do it, because we couldn't get it right. But he could, and it cost him everything, and he still said it's worth it. And he stayed on that cross, and the father turned his face away for the first time in eternity. Not a million years, not a billion years, eternity. There had never been a moment the father looked away from the son because he was steeped in my sin. And then three days later, he rose from the grave and said, now... Let's do this. I still have a story for you. It is difficult, but I promise the difficulty is a blessing and it will make you stronger and it will make you more like me and I will use you in ways that you can't imagine. So we pursue steadfastness, not just to boast about our strength. We pursue steadfastness because the reality is life is difficult. God did not create us to be fearful and to run from the difficulty but instead to lean into it, to be the hands and feet of Christ, to speak the gospel even when it is difficult and challenging and maybe even a little bit scary. That's what it means to follow Christ. Church, I'm so excited to have this chance to serve with you every single week. It is an absolute joy to be part of our church and our community. I love seeing what God's doing. Yesterday, the ladies' tea, I do have to confess, I lied to you guys. I said I wasn't gonna be there. I was there. I just wanted to see what all the fuss was. I got that FOMO and it was amazing. Ladies who put that together, thank you. Ladies who came out and were just part of that. It's so awesome to see what God is doing in our community, bringing us together and allowing us to be a force for hope, the hands and feet of Christ. My encouragement this week is that as you leave here and as you face difficulty, because it will come this week, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert. You will have a difficult moment this week, okay? That when you face it, that rather than adopt the pose that our culture has come to pull, to lean away from it, then instead you would lean into it, trusting that God is at work. Church, I love you. Hope you guys have a great week. God bless.